Welcome to a presentation of the denial of death by Ernst Becker. In his 1974 Pulitzer Prize winning book, The Denial of Death, Ernest Becker sets out on a grand project to bridge analytic insights and religious doctrine. He bases his project on a few key assumptions. Man is heroic and narcissistic, he says. By this he means that it that it, it is quite simply natural for man to strive to be a hero, no matter if we're talking about the high heroism of a Churchill or a Buddha, or the heroism of a coal miner or a Tibetan monk. We are all inspiring to be a hero, and the striving for heroism goes hand in hand with our basic narcissism. First of all, we are preoccupied with ourselves and place ourselves foremost in creation. Just look at small siblings, Becker says, and watch how they will scream and make a scene if they feel just the slightest bit overlooked. Deep down, this narcissism even rejects the idea of our own mortality. Sure, all living is mortal, we admit, but I am still special in creation, we protest. I must be. Everything I experience tells me I'm special. Well, you're not, says Becker. Like all other humans, you fall victim to the paradoxical nature of your essence. The fact that man is half animal and half symbolic. In his mind, man can go everywhere and anywhere, but man's body betray him. It is a dying organism and at the end awaits a rotting corpse and utter annihilation, be it from human evil, a deadly disease, a freak accident or age. The last one never fails. This is the paradox. Man is out of nature and hopelessly in it. Man's body is a material, fleshy casing that is alien to him in many ways. The strangest and most repugnant way being that it aches and bleeds and will decay and die and that it is embarrassingly plain. Man is literally split in two. He has an awareness of his own splinter uniqueness and yet he goes back into the ground to rot and disappear forever. That is a terrifying dilemma to be in and to have to live with. It is only if you let the full weight of this paradox sink down on your mind and feelings that you can realize what an impossible situation it is for an animal to be in. The terror of death lurks behind everything and is the central organizing theme in all human beings on their deepest level. As such, we try to overcome it on a personal level. We build edifices, a family line that spans three generations, but the quest to overcome death goes far beyond. Society itself is a vehicle for earthly heroics, with men on a collective level fashioning great projects to overcome death. But let us look more closely at the stages Becker goes through. To start with, let's look at the ways we try to overcome the terror of personal death. For Ernest Becker, the nature is a terrifying place, and in the end, it will kill you. To reflect intimately on our personal death is a terrifying experience. In fact, it is so all-consuming so all a thought that it can only be present for limited periods at a time. If it was constantly present in one's mental, mental functioning, the organism could not function. The idea of death must therefore be properly repressed, but to repress does not mean that the terror goes away. It just means that we have to maintain a constant psychological effort to keep the lid on the repressed thoughts. And still they, they will creep through the defense mechanisms in our minds and guide us on a fundamental level. For women, menopause especially reawakens the horror of the body, the utter bankruptcy of the body as a viable Corsair Sweep project. That is something that is cause of itself, a term Becker borrows from Spinoza. The woman is reminded in the most forceful way that she is an animal thing. Menopause is a sort of animal birthday that specifically marks the physical career of the generation. It is like nature imposing a definite physical milestone on the person, putting up a wall and saying, you are not going any further into life now. You are going toward the end now, to the absolute determinism of death. All at once, the woman is forced to catch up psychologically with the physical facts of life. Or to paraphrase Goethe, death doesn't keep knocking on her door only to be ignored, as men ignore their aging, but kicks it in to show itself full in the face. 
This again shows how important it is for man to resign himself to his earthly condition, his creatureliness and the mourning of one's own eventual death, and thus the working of it out of one's unconscious, where it blocks one's emotional maturity. One must, so to speak, work himself out of his own system. Now, let's look at some basic psychoanalytic ideas. The father of analytic psychotherapy, Sigmund Freud, based his theories on the repression of sexuality and desire. Today, however, we realize that all Freud's talk about blood and excrement, sex and guilt is true, not because of urges to incest and fears of castration, but because all these things reflect man's horror of his own basic animal condition. Let's consider the problem of anality in this light. For Freud, it was rooted in sex and guilt, but in an existential light, it reflects the dualism of man's condition, his self and his body. The mind can take man anywhere, but the awareness of our body takes us right back into raw nature, strangest and most degrading of all the discovery that the body has a hole from which stinking smells and a stinking substance emerge. In this light, the anus and its incomprehensible repulsive product represent not only physical determinism, but the fate of all that is physical, decay and death. What we call anal character traits are therefore just various forms of the universal protest against accident and death. To say that someone is anal means that someone is trying extra hard to to protect himself against the accidents of life and danger of death, trying to pass himself off as anything but an animal. The same is true with regards to Freud's central idea, the Oedipus complex. When we replace repressed sexuality with repression of death, the Oedipus complex becomes the Oedipal project that sums up the basic problems of the child's life. Whether he will be a passive object of fate and appendage of others, a plaything of the world, or whether he will be an active center within himself, whether he will control his own destiny with his own powers or not. No matter which project man chooses, though, he has also to produce a certain madness, since he cannot accept nature as it is. And so he develops his own personal madness in the form of certain character traits through which he distills reality to fit his personal approach. In this light, one may claim that Character traits are actually secret psychosis. What does this mean? It means that man creates a character, a front he shows the world that is dominated by certain traits. Why? Well, because the world is such a terrifying experience that man cannot confront it simply as it is. That would be too maddening. No, he has to fashion a certain way to deal with the world, a certain way he can hold it at length and so not be overwhelmed by its potential terrors. By creating his certain character, man can tell himself he knows his ways of the world. The defenses that form a person's character support a grand illusion. And when we grasp this, we can understand the full drivenness of man. He is driven away from himself, from self-knowledge, self-reflection. He is driven towards things that support the lie of his character. In short... Man is applying a complicated technique for avoiding misery, but misery is the reality. That is why from earliest times sagas have insisted that to see reality, one must die and be reborn. But to suffer one's own death and to be reborn is not easy, and it is, it is not easy precisely because so much of one has to die. This is what makes change, any change, so difficult, a deep inner layer in ourselves has to die for change to occur. Only by facing the terror of death that we carry around in our secret heart, only when we explode the innermost layer do we get to the the layer of what we might call our authentic self, what we really are without sham, without disguise, without defenses against fear. From this sketch, we can get some idea of the difficult and excruciatingly painful all-or-nothing process that psychological rebirth is. And make no mistake, it takes men of granite 
men who are automatically powerful, secure in their drivenness, and it makes them tremble and cry. To see the world as it really is, is devastating and terrifying. It achieves the very result that the, the child has painfully built his character over the years in order to avoid. It makes routine, automatic, secure, self-confident activity impossible. It makes thoughtless living in the world of men an impossibility. It places a trembling animal at the mercy of the entire cosmos and the problem of the meaning of it. From here, let's look at Soren Kierkegaard. Nowhere is the merger of religious and psychiatric ca categories clearer than in, than, in, than in the work of Soren Kierkegaard. The foundation stone for Kierkegaard's view of man is the myth of the fall, the ejection of Adam and Eve from the Garden of Eden. Man emerged from his instinctive, thoughtless action of the lower animals and came to reflect on his condition. Came to reflect on his condition. He was given a consciousness of his individuality and his part divinity in creation, the beauty and uniqueness of his face and his name. But at the same time, he was given the consciousness of the terror of the world and of his own death and decay. Thus, the fall into self-consciousness had one great penalty for man. It gave him dread or anxiety. Kierkegaard's whole understanding of man's character is that it is a structure built up to avoid the perception of the terror of death. What style does man use to function automatically and uncritically in the world, and how does this style cripple his true growth and freedom of action and choice? Kierkegaard describes one such type of person in what we today call inauthentic men. That is, men who avoid developing their own uniqueness. They follow out the styles of automatic and uncritical living in which they were conditioned as children. They are inauthentic in that they do not belong to themselves, do not act from their own center, totally immersed in the fictional games being played, at, being played in their society. For Kierkegaard, philistinism was triviality, man lulled by the daily routines of his society, content with the satisfactions that it offers him, the car, the shopping center, and the summer vacation. For Kierkegaard, what a healthy person would be like if he did not lie is a much more daring venture. Since man takes part in divine creation but is himself a finite being, Kierkegaard says, he has to look for something far beyond man, something to be achieved, striven for, something that leads man beyond himself. The healthy person for Kierkegaard is the one who has transcended himself. How does one transcend himself? By realizing the truth of his situation, by dispelling the lie of his character and face up to the anxiety of the terror of existence. The finite self must be destroyed in order to see beyond to infinitude, to absolute transcendence, to the ultimate power of creation which made finite creatures. Once the person begins to look to his relationship to the ultimate power, to infinitude, and to refashion his links from those around him to that ultimate power, he opens up to himself the horizon of unlimited possibility of real freedom. This is Kierkegaard's message and the meaning of faith. Freud also pushed psychoanalytic theory to its limits, but did not come out at faith. Becker explains in a number of ways how Freud's character should tell us at least some of the reasons. But one of the reasons Freud would not, could not yield was that he could not tolerate any religious dogma within the psychoanalytic school. Any such mysticism would threaten his entire psychoanalytical life project or his causes we project. Yielding on this matter would present nothing less than the abandonment of his causes we project and be the deepest, completest, total emotional ad admission on Freud's part that there is no strength within oneself, no power to bear the superfluity of experience. To yield was That's to right. admit that support has to come from outside oneself and that justification for one's life has to come totally from some self-transcending web in which one consents to be suspended. And this Freud could never do grounded in reality, in scientific truth as he, as he was. From here, let's look at the spell cast by persons. 
A winner of the Miss Maryland contest describes her first meeting with Frank Sinatra. He was my date. I got a message and I must have taken five aspirins to calm myself down. In the restaurant, I saw him from across the room and I got such butterflies in my stomach and such a thing that went from head to toe. He had like a halo around his head of stars to me. He projected something I have never seen in my life. When I'm with him, I'm in awe. And I don't know why I can't snap out of it. I can't think he's so fascinating. Why does man give his loyalty to this one or that one to obey so blindly and willingly? All through history, masses have followed leaders because of the magic aura they projected, because they seemed larger than life. Men worship and fear power and so give their loyalty to, to those who dispense it. But this explanation touches only the surface. Men don't become slaves out of mere calculating self-interest. The slavishness is in the soul. We want to melt into the leader's aura. Freud saw the same thing happen in the patient and analyst analyst relationship and called it transference. The patient transfers the feelings he had towards his parents as a child to the person of the physician. He blows the physician up larger than life just as the, just as the child sees the parents. He becomes as dependent on him and draws protection and power from him just like a child merges his destiny with the parents. The same thing happens with groups. In groups, men simply become dependent children again blindly following the inner voice of their parents, which now come to them under the hypnotic spell of the leader. They abandon their egos to his, identifies with his power, and do not fear danger any, any longer because they no longer feel alone and small. The result is the practicing of a safe heroism where people will claim to believe in a bigger cause, but with no actual courage, even desire to stand on their own feet for it. As part of the group, the leader takes the responsibility, and so everyone can see themselves as guiltless and temporary victims of the leader. When people try for heroics from the position of willing slavishness, there is nothing to admire. It is all automatic, predictable, and pathetic. But however pathetic transference might be, it is also an expression of a deeper desire to merge with one's surroundings. In Christianity, it is, it is the motif of agape, the natural melting of created life in the creation in, in life which transcends it. In other words, when man merge, merges with the self-transcending parents or social group, he is, in some real sense, trying to live in some larger expansiveness of meaning. We miss the complexity of heroism if we fail to understand this point, Becker stresses. From here... Let's look at natural guilt and the creative solution. Man is born with a natural guilt owing to the fact that he has a need to feel he sticks out and feels guilt for wanting to stick out and then more guilt when he does stick out. It's a feeling of unworthiness or badness that man has, and for good reasons. Compared to the rest of nature, man is not a very satisfactory creation. Who is he to suggest he has the right to stick out? This makes personal heroism through individuation a very daring venture precisely because it separates the person out of comfortable beyond. It takes a strength and courage the average man doesn't have. The most terrifying burden of the creature is to be isolated, which is what happens in, in individuation once one separates oneself out of the herd. These are the risks when the person when the person begins to fashion consciously and critically his own framework of heroic self-reference. It is also the definition of the artist type or the creative type generally. The key to the creative type is that he is separated out of the common pool of shared meanings. There is something in his life experience that makes him take in the world as a problem. As a result, he has to make personal sense out of it. Existence becomes a product existence becomes a problem that needs an ideal answer. But when you no longer accept the collective solution to the problem of existence, you must fashion your own. The work of art, then, is the ideal answer of the creative type to the problem of existence as he takes it in. It is his private religion, as Otto Rank put it. 
Its uniqueness gives him personal immortality. It is his own beyond and not that of others. But one cannot justify his own heroism. That would take a god. And so man is in a terrible bind. If you are going to be a hero, you must give a gift. If you are the average man, you give the gift that society specifies in advance. But if you are an artist, you fashion a peculiar personal gift, the justification of your own heroic identity. But you cannot base the divinity of this project on average man that is bound to be skeptical of your creative and artistic thoughts, or you would not be an artist. And besides, average man cannot grant you the immortality of your personal soul. In the end, there is no way for the artist to be at peace with his work or with the society that accepts it. And so, Arturan concludes, the artist's gift is always to creation itself, to the ultimate meaning of life, to God. As we have established, the essence of normality is the refusal of normality. In this sense, we are all neurotic since we all lie about our reality, but we call people neurotic that have more trouble with their lies than others. The world is too much with them, and the techniques that they have developed for holding it at bay and cutting it down to size finally be begin to choke the person himself. The neurotic has taken on a lifestyle that begins to constrict too much, that prevents free forward momentum, new choices and growth that a person may want and need. He feels stuck in his narrow horizon, needs his particular beyond, but fears moving past it. His safe heroics is not working out. It is choking him and poisoning him with the dumb realization that it is so safe that it is not heroic at all. Obsessions, compulsions, and phobias of all kinds are other ways to narrow down the world down to simple do's and don'ts. Say, fear of spiders or fear of flying, where you protect, project deadly qualities into certain things in your surroundings and so tell yourself that if you avoid these things that you can more or less control, you avoid death. The ironic thing about the narrowing down of neurosis is that the person seeks to avoid death but he does it by killing off so much of himself that he becomes as though dead. What characterizes modern life, Becker says, is the failure of traditional immortality ideologies to absorb and quicken man's hunger for self-perpetuation and heroism. Neurosis today is a widespread problem because of the dis disappearance of convincing dramas of heroic apotheosis of man. He cannot find his heroism in everyday life anymore as men did in traditional societies, and ends up needing revolutions and wars and continuing revolutions to, to fill the void. Rank saw that this hyper-self-conscious had left modern man to his own resources and he called him aptly psychological man. Psychological because he became isolated from protective collective ideologies and had to justify himself from within, but also psychological because modern thought itself evolved that way when it developed out of religions. The inner life of man had always been portrayed traditionally as the area of the soul, but in the 19th century, scientists wanted to reclaim this last domain of superstition from the church. They wanted to make the inner life of man an area free of mystery and subject to the laws of causality. The great miracles of language, thought, and morality could now be studied as social products and not divine in interventions culminating with Freud. But it was Rank who saw that this sci scientific victory caused more problems than, than it solved. Psychology narrows the cause for personal unhappiness down to the person himself, and then he is stuck with himself. But all the analysis in the world won't allow the person to find out who he is and why he is here on earth, how he can make his life a triumph, and why he has to die. Modern man needs a thou to whom to turn for spiritual and moral dependence, and since God is, in, is not in fashion, the therapist has, has had to replace him. The problem is that faith Ask that man expands himself trustingly into the non-logical, into the truly fantastic. But this spiritual expansion modern, mind, modern man finds most difficult precisely because he is constricted into himself and has nothing to lean on. No collective drama that makes fantasy seem real because it is lived and shared. 
The most illuminating way to view depression or melancholia is as a, a problem of lack of courage. It develops in people who are afraid of life, who have given up any semblance of independent development, totally immersed in the acts and the aid of others. They are on their way to total helplessness and dependency and have given up all hope in, in themselves. For the depressed, self-accusation of worthlessness are not only a reflection of guilt over, very real one might add, unlived life, but also a language for making sense out of one's situation. Even if one is a guilty hero, one is at least a hero in the same hero system. The depressed person uses guilt to hold on to his worldview and to keep his situation unchanged. Otherwise, he would have to analyze it or be able to move out of it and transcend it. Better to take on guilt then, even exaggerate it to show remorse, than the terrible burden of freedom and responsibility, especially when the choice comes too late in life for one to be able to start over again. If depression is based on too much necessity, too much restriction, schizophrenia represents the other extreme solution, too much possibility. I've put in crazy cat lady here. Um, it might not be uh, all fair, but just think of the person that is, uh, you keeps very secluded, you run into them, and maybe they will start rambling for an hour about some far-out conspiracy theory or that they're being watched by the government. Uh, that's the schizophrenic, all living in their head with a thousand plans and a thousand possibilities, but they are completely out of contact with their basic animality, their death. The schizophrenic reflects on himself and comes to understand that his animal body is a menace to himself. When you are not even sec securely anchored in this body, you really have a problem. Terror becomes unabsorbable by anything neural or fleshy and your symbolic awareness floats at maximum intensity all by itself, all the time. For the schizophrenic, the body has completely happened to him. It is a mass of, of stench and decay. The only thing intimate, intimate about it is that it is a direct channel of vulnerability. In this way, the schizophrenic is very much like the creative type. But if he has no talent, he is simply totally crippled by life and death fears, whereas the creative and talented, equally schizophrenic, may channel his response in the work of genius. In the end, then, Mental illness is a matter of cowardice and stupidity. It reflects a desperate ignorance about how one is going about satisfying one's motives. The desire to affirm oneself and to yield oneself are, after all, very neutral. We can choose any path for them, any object, any level of heroics. The suffering and the evil that occur in our lives are not a consequence of the nature of the motives thems themselves, but of our stupidity about satisfying them. This is the deeper meaning of one of Rank's insights. You know what really is beyond psychology? Stupidity. From this sketching, we know that people try to, to win converts for their point of view because it is more than merely an outlook on life. It is an immortality formula, and in matters of immortality, everyone has the same self-righteous conviction, and authorities who are equally unimpeachable hold opposite views. Kierkegaard had his own formula for what it means to be a man in what he calls the night of faith. This figure is the man who lives in faith, who has given over the meaning of life to his creator, and who lives centered on the energies of his maker. He accepts whatever happens in this visible dimension without complaint, lives his life as a duty, faces his death without a qualm. No pettiness is so petty that it's that it threatens his meaning, no task is too frightening to be beyond his courage. He is fully in the world on its terms and wholly beyond the world in his trust in the invisible dimension. The great strength of such an ideal is that it allows one to be open, generous, courageous, to touch others' lives and enrich them and open them in turn. As the night of faith has no fear of life and death trip to lay on to others, he does not... He does not coerce or manipulate them. The night of faith then represents what we might call an ideal of mental health. Put in these abstract terms, the ideal of the night of faith is surely one of the most beautiful and challenging ideals ever put forth by man. 
It is contained in most religions in one form or another, and like all ideas, it is a creative illusion meant to lead men on, and leading men on is not the easiest thing. What is there to choose between religious creatureliness and scientific creatureliness? Becker asked. The most one can achieve is a certain relaxedness and openness to experience that makes him less of a driven burden on others. And a lot of this depends on how much talent he has, how much of a daemon is driving him. How does a man create from all his living energies a system of thought wholly directed to the problems of this world and then just give it up to the invisible one? How does one lean on God and give over everything to him and still stand on his own feet as a passionate human being? These are not rhetorical questions. They are real ones that go right to the heart of the problem of how to be a man. The terror of death is central but not the only motif of life. Heroic transcendence, victory over evil for mankind as a, as a whole, for unborn generation, consecration of one's existence to higher meanings. These motifs are just as vital and they are what give the human animal his nobility even in the face of his animal fears. Modern men do not realize that hedonism, at least for most men, is not heroism. And so they sell their soul to consumer capitalism or consumer con communism or replace their souls with psychology. Psychotherapy is, is such a growing vogue today because people want to know why they are unhappy in hedonism and look for faults within themselves. Today the Hollywood myth has replaced the paradise and heaven myth of Christianity and the new healers offer psychology to gain paradise through self-knowledge. This is not to say psychotherapy cannot give great gifts to tortured and overwhelmed people. It can allow people to affirm themselves, to smash idols that constrict the self-esteem, to lift the load of neurotic guilt. But often psychotherapy seems to promise the moon a more constant joy, delight, celebration of life, perfect love and perfect freedom. It seems to promise that these things are easy to come by once self-knowledge is achieved, that they are things that should and could characterize one's whole waking awareness. Myths and creative illusion in itself is not bad. Some myths are vegetative and generate real conceptual power, real apprehension of a dim truth we miss by sharp analytic reason. Most of all, beliefs about reality affect people's real action. They help introduce the new into the world. And if something influences our efforts to change the world, then to some extent it must change that world. But if you are going to have a myth of a new being, Becker repeats, then you have to use this myth as a call to the highest and most difficult effort, and not to simple joy. A creative myth is not simply a relapse into comfortable illusion. It has to be as bold as possible in order to be truly generative. There is no nonsense here. For man to have the courage to be himself, his daily life becomes a duty of cosmic proportions, and his courage to face the anxiety of meaninglessness becomes a true cosmic heroism. No longer does one do as God wills, set over against some imaginary figure in heaven. Rather, in one's own person, he tries to achieve what the creative powers of emergent beings have themselves so far achieved with lower forms of life, the overcoming of that which would negate life. In the mysterious ways in which life is given to us in, in evolution on this planet, it pushes in the direction of its own expansions. We don't understand it simply because we don't know the purpose of creation. In conclusion, Becker finishes, a project as grand as the scientific mythical construction of victory over human limitation is not something that, that can be programmed by science. Who knows what form the forward momentum of life will take in the time ahead or what use it will make of our anguished searching. The most that any one of us can seem to do is to fashion something an object or ourselves, and to drop it into the confusion, make an offering of it, so to speak, to the life force. That was a rather comprehensive um, presentation of Ernest Becker, The Denial of Death. I really uh, give it my 
warmest recommendation. It's um, I read it after I read Irvin Yalom, uh, Existential Psychotherapy, and um, Irvin Yalom is like um, it's like a book you look up in if you have any question, um, and it's an amazing book. Uh, what I like about the denial of death is that it really, uh, in another way, sets out sort of a plan. And uh, I guess I'm really happy with all the ideas and the inclusion of uh, Kierkegaard that I think are quite beautiful and quite riveting and dreadful, but but <laughs> yeah, dreadful. But uh, they are actually, yeah. If you give them some chance, they really do have something. So I hope uh, you enjoyed this presentation. Uh, my website is called www.skeleton-man.com. Um, and I will be making more presentations. And on this site, I am also presenting my other project, DJ Skeleton Man, where I um, present the other side of life. Uh, if one thing is the rational thinking and... Uh, um, yeah, Kierkegaardian way of being. Then another one surely is to be um, all about dancing and celebrating life. And um, that's what I try to do with the uh, DJ Skeleton Man project. So do check out my website, um, Skeleton. Is that a slash or a dash? Man. Anyway, you can see it. And uh, yeah. Hope you uh, want to see uh, all the stuff I do there. There's going to be more presentations, like I said, of, uh, well, Irvin Yalom and uh, Kierkegaard as well at some point. So I uh, hope to see you there and take care. Bye.